Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 71 of the Be Yourself and Love It podcast with me, Anthony Samroff. I'm joined here by an extraordinarily special guest, Lauren Lockman from the Tanglewood Wellness Center in Costa Rica. I don't think it would be exaggerating to say he has actually been sort of a mentor of mine. He's got 500 videos on his YouTube channel, and I must have watched a ridiculous number of them. But more importantly than that, um, I've really applied the wisdom that Lauren has put out there that he's accumulated over decades of taking people through long-term fasts and learning about nutrition, health, how to receive optimum health, how to create optimum health, and uh, also psychological and spiritual well-being. So, uh, Lauren, thank you so much for joining me in the Be Yourself and Love It podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Okay. So, a lot, to a lot of people, the idea of fasting, like not eating, well, I would say like people would be like, what, you went for a whole day without eating? But the truth is, right. people can't even go for a single meal, can't even skip a meal without... That's, that's true. <laughs> My family couldn't believe that I was fasting. And the reason for that is I'm notorious for getting really, really irritable uh, when my meal's late. So um, uh, I actually find it easier, <laughs> easier to fast than to uh, just get one meal. But, um, so for a lot of people, that seems extreme and crazy. So why don't you tell us, just to start off with, what's, and you might be here for the whole interview if you go too far into this, but what are the benefits of fasting? Why is this so, why is this so recommended for people? Sure. But well, if you don't mind, I think I'll start by answering a slightly different question, and then we'll come to that one. Sure. And that question, I think, is, um, you know, because the benefits are, are critically important, of course, but how do we even justify this? As you said, you know, most people think this is radical, this is crazy, it's insane. Um, you're, you know, how can starving help you? And what's important to understand, first of all, I think, as a starting point, Anthony, is that healing... And, and cleansing, we hear a lot about detoxification these days, and it's very real, but cleansing and healing the body are biological processes. And what that means, to be completely clear, is that the organism cleanses and heals itself. There, there's no substance that you can take. There's nothing you can eat. There's nothing you can drink. There's no supplement that can cleanse or heal the body. The body is self-cleansing and self-healing. If we look at nature, where it's estimated that there are roughly 25 million animal species, most of them insects, virtually every species, when it's sick enough or badly enough injured, will lie down and stop moving and, and refuse to eat. I mean, animals in nature don't eat, you know, if it's your cat or dog. And if, if you're listening, you may have seen this happen. Your cat or dog gets sick, maybe it eats something it doesn't agree with, you know, whatever it could be, or it gets badly injured, it'll just rest completely, refuse to eat. You can put food right in front of it. It won't touch it. It's not that it doesn't have access to food because it can't get to it. You can put the food right in front of its face and it won't touch it because it instinctively knows. And while this may sound foreign to most people, I think the truth is, you know, if you reflect, Anthony, if you reflect on your own yeah. life, when you were a boy and you got sick, you lost your appetite. So true. Chances are good that your mother who meant well and you know, believe that it was important for you to eat, probably made you eat. Mm. But your body, you weren't hungry because your body knew very clearly that in order to have enough energy to, to do whatever healing was necessary, it didn't want to eat. Processing food takes too much of the body's energy, about half the body's energy. And so when, well, first of all, you, know, you want to be clear that although this may sound crazy because it's been lost to our culture, this is something that's always been around. In fact, if I can support that a little further, most of you, I'm sure you know who Hippocrates was. Mm. Yes. The guy the, in the, South Florida. Um, physician, Greek, ancient Greek physician or something. That's, that's right. He, he was considered the, the world's first Western physician, um, you know, very famous. And in fact, he, he, made, he made two famous quotes. The first one was, first, do no harm. That was uh, co-opted by Western medicine, who then completely forgot about it because, right. because Western medicine kills more people than anything besides cancer and heart disease. Those are official statistics, and some people say kills more people, 
period, than anything. But the, the second one, which anyone interested in alternative medicine is probably familiar with, and that is let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. Right. And, you know, it's interesting. There, there's a place in Florida called the Hippocrates Health Institute. Uh, they, they offer a juicing and, and wheatgrass and all this stuff. And I was in, on a lecture tour in South Florida some seven years ago, I think. I had a group of people, about 20 Hippocrates health educators, their health educators in a room that I was lecturing to. And I said, who knows what his very next words were? The very next words that Hippocrates said, what were they? And nobody knew. I mean, you know, here's a place named for this guy, mm. and they didn't know. And the actual quote, what Hippocrates said was, let your food be your medicine, and your medicine be your food. But to feed yourself when you're already sick is to feed your sickness. Wow. Yeah, and it brings to mind another quote. I think it was from Egypt. A man lives on a quarter of what he eats. What he eats. And the other three his, quarters lives the, his doctor. Yeah, the, on the other three quarters lives his doctor. So it's yeah. interesting that you said that the body cleanses itself and you don't actually have to take anything in um, to do that if you fast. But it's interesting because everyone wants to add something. Oh, I'll take a superfood. Oh, I'll... Um, I'll take these herbs, I'll, I'll take this tincture, the homeopathy, the drugs. I feel sick, I want to take some drugs. Everyone wants to add something. No one right. wants to drop anything, you know? No, that's, that's right, because I think it's, it's, a, it's a cultural defect. I mean, it's a, it's, you know, part of, our, part of being human is that we're, we're looking for shortcuts. Mm. And it's understandable. Unfortunately, there aren't any shortcuts. Right. We don't improve the process by trying to manipulate the body in any way, the very best we can do. I think what's really separated Tanglewood from any other place is that we are 100% committed to showing people how to get out of the body's way. Right. So the body can do what it needs to do. I have a Facebook group called Getting Out of Your Way right. with Lauren. And oh, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. So you know, that's, that's the idea. Um, in, in fact, I mean, I think since, since you brought this up, if you add anything, while you're fasting, anything that contains calories or nutrients, you are not fasting. Right. The, the specific benefit, you know, the, the whole cascade of beneficial physiological uh, processes that occur only occurs in the absence of calories or nutrients. Yes, I, I've been surprised by how many people I've told that I fasted or I was fasting and they said, oh, I've done that. And then uh, I asked them uh, to, to hear more what they got of it. I said, and it turns out that they were um, taking some juice or tinctures or right. even having one cup of coffee every day, uh, black. And that's a trend just now. But let, let's come. And I was like, oh, well, I'm not really sure that's fasting. One, one person I knew um, took some cannabis oil to still his stomach because right. he felt too anxious otherwise. And I'm like, yeah, I'm really, really not sure if that's fasting. So that's right. I, without meaning, because we, we actually had, I asked you, what well, can I not even have a cup of chamomile tea? Um, and what would happen if someone put a squeeze of lemon in their water when they were when What they were happens is the body, the body sees nutrients and thinks there's food coming and goes back to normal feeding physiology. Right. So if I'm to understand that I'm taking this seriously, I'm like, I've watched Lauren Lockman's videos and he doesn't recommend fasting more than a week on your own unsupervised. So I'm going to do this week. And I'm five days in, or let's say even I was going to do more than that. And I have a punnet of strawberries. Does that put me straight back to day one? I can't just go on fasting. The that's, same correct. Day. That's, that's correct. That's correct. You eat okay. and your body goes back. It, it takes... 10 to 11 days to get to the deepest part of the process, which is why, you know, it's interesting. I, there's my, my largest competitor <clears throat> is a center in Northern California where their average fast is about 10 days. Right. And yet, it, and yet it takes 10 to 11 days to get to the deepest part of the process. So our average fast is 26 days and very few people here fast wow. less than 21 days. We, this, this session, we, we operate in 10 week sessions. This session, We'll have about 50 people here over the course of the session. And I suspect we'll have two people that are here fasting less than 21 days. Wow. Virtually everybody else does at least 21 days with 26, 30, 
35, E42 being, you know, not that unusual. Right. If my hair wasn't already falling out, I think the rest of it is gone at the sound, it's the sound of uh, 28 days and more, more fasting. But uh, no, I, I'm familiar with your work. So I'm speaking on behalf of the listener. That would definitely, right. that's, that's extreme. Now I'm going to come, uh, so let, let's take that a little bit further, right? Why these long-term fasts? Why can't someone just fast once a week or so and maybe do um, a week once a year or, or, or if they're feeling uh, brave because um, 10 or 11 days uh, a few times, what's the, what's the purpose of this 21, 28 days fast? That to, or even in some cases if people have chronic conditions more, uh, what's, the, what's the value of this? Well, the, the simple answer is that you simply can't accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Um, I don't know how old you are, Anthony. I'm guessing we're around the same age, 29. Yeah, right. That's it. Uh, um, uh, uh, your, your, your paper round was a little bit harder than mine at 29, Lauren, but uh, I've, I've, I've been sticking around 29 so, for a few years myself. So. Right. You know, if you've, <clears throat> if you've been on the planet already for uh, two, three, four, five decades or more, uh, you, and, you know, I mean, today it, it's, the, the world is a pretty toxic place. Mm. Um, you know, just consider the fact that Wi-Fi is carcinogenic, that uh, microwave signal is carcinogenic. The more of it you're exposed to, the more toxic your body is. That, you know, air pollution is rampant. I mean, when, when I was uh, a kid, there were a lot fewer cars on the planet than there are today. Um, you know, today, we uh, pesticide use uh, really re started being a, a serious issue, it really became a real industry. Just half a dozen, uh, less than 10 years before I was born. Mm. Okay, so think about the condition of the world when I was a child and the condition of the world today, 60, nearly 70 years later. It's a very different place. It's a much more toxic place. And the average person has a lot of toxins in the body. Now, you know, it's funny because I'll sometimes people say things like, oh, come on, we're not that toxic. That's right. a bunch of crap. Well, there, there was a study in North America. It's probably been 20 years ago now. And they took a statistically significant sample size. That means a large enough group of people to represent the population. You know, because if you, mm. you're in a population of 350 million people and you study three people, it doesn't tell you very much. Uh, it has to be large enough to, to be representative. And what they did was they looked for 75 persistent environmental toxins. So these are persistent means that they don't break down quickly. They last a long time. You know, they might have a half-life of, of uh, thousands or millions of years in some cases. And these were substances like DDT, dioxin, polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, these are chemicals that were designed to insulate electrical wires and turned out to be incredibly toxic. Mm. Uh, these substances, each of these three substances are banned in North America. They're still manufactured. Um, okay to ship them to other places, but you can't use them in North America. And what they found was that in fact, most of these 75 substances were, had, hadn't been in use for decades in North America. And what they found was that the average person had more than 50% of them in their tissue in measurable quantity. Right. So when we talk about people being toxic, you know, make no mistake about it. This is very real. And for the average person who eats a standard diet, whether it's a standard American diet, a standard Scottish diet, whatever it might be, uh, the body's getting more toxic every day right. with every meal. I mean, you know, again, in, in North America, I, I don't know exactly what happens. I, I've been in Scotland a few times. It's beautiful. Um, but in North America, the average person now gets over 61% of their calories from ultra processed foods right. and over 35% from animal products. And that means over 96% of their calories are coming from things that never belong in the human body. Right. Okay. So we're going to come, we're, I think we're going to circle back to the animal products thing. Uh, I've been a vegetarian for 11 years and kind of more on the vegan side in the, the previous years, but uh, there's definitely been a rise of a lot of, um, well, mostly meat-based diets. And I'd like to talk to, about them in a second, but I want to speak to something that you said about this toxic, um, these toxic substances, because on one, yeah, I, I was just today, I was listening to a physician called uh, 
Trey Klinghardt, I don't know if you've heard of him before, he's a toxicologist, yeah. and he was talking about when, um, uh, originally when they were looking at toxicology, the main things were like mercury and lead poisoning, and now it's like alu uh, uh, aluminum, as you say in the state, well, you would say in the States, where are you there? And we say aluminium. But also he actually said that when he was looking at people with chronic illnesses, the more their chronic illness, when they, when they took samples, the more toxins were in their tissues. And yet the skeptic society sort of every day, you know, uh, I, I love them because they're always skeptical about anything that isn't mainstream and they think they're <laughs> radicals. And they, they always seem to, they, they're not skeptical about main, mainstream medicine, that's for sure. But anything that isn't mainstream medicine, they love to try and poke holes and in the bunk. Uh, and yet they'll say, oh, the liver and kidneys clean all the toxins from the body. They've got this uh, NPC meme that when anyone mentions detoxification, they all say exactly the same thing, like they've read it from a, a hymn sheet, which they would. So what about the what about that? What about the uh, the bodies? Like, is this um, is the body able to cleanse itself? Even uh, actually, what I want to mention is you're just talking about the toxic chemicals that we put in by mistake because it went into our food supply, it went into our air. You know, conspiracy theorists. They may be right, I, I, I are talking about the um, fluoride in the water and the aspartame in their, uh, and the bromine in their bread and the aspartame and the fizzy drinks. And then the same people who are complaining about the fluoride in the water go out to McDonald's. So you're talking about the toxins right. people put into their body involuntarily. But right. actually, day to day, it seems like so many of us uh, just go out and put things into our body that we know are harmful for us, right? That's right. Even these, uh, the, the people on the paleo diet at least try and get uh, beef that's uh, grass-fed or something like that. You know, they, they're, they're, they're not advocating. They, they know fine well that a McDonald's is going to harm them. So why is it? Do we have such low self-esteem these days that we're willing to put poison into our body? How, how did it get this far? Yeah, well, I, I, think, uh, I think low self-esteem certainly may be part of it. And, you know, this is a challenging subject and, and probably a whole nother show. Uh, contact me, we can schedule that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's, I mean, there's really not enough time to explore that completely here yeah. today. But, but yeah, you know, I, I believe, and I think you're, you're aware of this, that first of all, you know, when we're little tiny babies, the one thing we all really needed, the only thing we really needed, we needed a sufficient food to stay alive. Yeah. But there are children who grow up, you know, practically starving and grow up to be healthy people mm -hmm. because they had unconditional love or, or perhaps right. theoretically, I don't know if this ever happens anymore, um, if anyone actually is able to give this to their child. Certainly in our cultures, that doesn't really happen. And it doesn't happen because we're passing on from one generation to the next, the self-loathing and low self-esteem. Right. Uh, you know, no one got love, unconditional love, and so no one has it to give away. And we, we wind up uh, making poor choices sometimes because it's what we think we deserve. Right. We also wind up um, becoming addicted to these substances, which are highly addictive mm. and you know, if you're listening today, I mean, consider the fact that the cigarette industry figured out decades ago, probably 60 years ago, that although tobacco uh, was addictive, they could make it more addictive. And that's what they do. They add nicotine to make it even more addictive. Certainly, the multi-billion dollar food processing giants discovered a long time, you know, realized a long time ago that they could make their substances more addictive as well. That's the reason why it's so hard to stop right. eating this crap once you start. Yeah, I think uh, the, the familiar story is uh, staying on the straight and narrow with good food for a while and then having a one pizza and you can't help but have another two or three over the next couple of weeks. You, well, you know, it's, it's, I, I had, a, I had a, a woman write to me last year who was interested in coming. And she said to me at the end of her email, she said, by the way, she said, I followed the optimal diet that you recommend for three years, 100% never veered. It was amazing. She said, one day I decided to try something. And it was something that most people would consider pretty healthy, mm. but it's not included in the optimal diet. Mm -hmm. And 
she said, I, you know, I thought I'd try it one time. That was five years ago and I've never been able to stop. It was oh, rice wow. and beans. Wow. She, had, she hadn't been, you know, as, as I, I know, you know, and your listeners may or may not know, I don't know if we want to get into this today, but I, you know, I eat a raw vegan diet yeah, for nearly 28, 28 years now. And this was rice and beans, relatively healthy food compared to what most people are eating, yes, but highly to... addictive, hard for her to stop. So why and her we... level of health and vitality had declined dramatically as a result of that. So why, are, why does the body crave foods that are not good for it? Did God make a mistake? You'd think we would crave foods that are good for us. Well, well, we do when the body is clean. It's not that the body ever craves this stuff on its own. It's that these toxic substances, as the body is, is getting rid of them, first of all, uh, especially, again, processed foods are specifically formulated to trigger dopamine release and things like this. Okay. You know, it's, it, there's, a, there's an effect. We're being drugged. And for most people, it feels better than being fully conscious. I mean, it's, it, right. dopamine's not even about yeah. consciousness. It's simply about feeling good. So when you're right. in love, there's a release of dopamine. Right. And as most women know, when you eat chocolate, right. the same thing yeah. happens. And so, you know, chocolate's easier than a boyfriend um, sure. for a lot of people. Don't, you don't get in many arguments with a bar of chocolate. And you don't need to... Um, consider the needs of a bar of chocolate and you know definitely you know i'm a counselor i'm a therapist that's what i do for a living and a lot of what i do is create a space for people to go into the unpleasant emotions that they don't want to face on their own and yeah. i think we do go unconscious myself included of course um, I could, that would be a whole show to talk maybe i'll talk to my listeners about some of the ways that i go unconscious to avoid facing my stuff and but it's really, really the liberating thing, but it is the hard road. And I guess it's, for me, based on my limited experience of fasting, uh, based on, after your tutelage, you know, I did one fast five and a half days, then six and a half days, then 11 and a half days. And um, I found the process very similar to the process of psychotherapy for myself. You know, I've gone to counseling myself in the sense that you don't necessarily know what you're going to cleanse first and right. it just kind of happens. And, yeah. also, and, and you don't get to choose because it just comes up on its own. Exactly. And that's what I always find when I go to my therapist, I always think I've got, well, I don't anymore. I've surrendered to the process, but I used to have something I wanted to work on, but right. now I just go without expectations and things come up. And when I right. let what comes up, I become a more powerful practitioner for my exactly. clients as well. Exactly. Yeah. So, it's very similar to the fast in that respect. And the other thing is that um, you go through a period of, you have to go through a period of pain or, or facing the stuff that are releasing process that might not necessarily be pleasant, but you feel damn good afterwards. Right. So, yeah. In fact, I don't know if, if you want to circle back around to the, sure. the original question, which was about the benefits of the process. Yes, that's, what I was, that's where I was going. Okay. Okay, great. So first of all, I mean, there, there, are, there are so many things where we don't have enough time, but yeah. we can, you know, we can sort of do it with broad brush strokes, talk about what's happening. Um, you know, again, the bottom line is that toxicity is very real. And I, you know, I never really had a chance to answer your question. You, you sort of moved on. Um, don't, don't we cleanse and heal? You know, don't we eliminate toxins mm -hmm. through the liver and kidneys? Yes, we do. Um, that's, that's what those, uh, one of the primary functions of the organs, the, the kidneys are balancing the blood, extracting all the garbage from the bloodstream that doesn't belong there, filtering all of your blood roughly 60 times per day. They never stop working. They're always filtering. Um, the liver, liver's job is to metabolize, primary job, to metabolize fat and to break down any toxins that enter the bloodstream. So toxins are sent to the liver where they're broken down to the best of the liver's ability and then go back into the bloodstream and are eliminated through the kidneys. A solid material, you know, things that come in with food are eliminated through the colon after the liver's done its job. But, um, but these, these are, I mean, again, you know, the study said half of the participants, statistically significant sample size, they had more than 50%. That's 38 or more of these incredibly toxic substances in their body in measurable quantities. And what that means is the body is not able to detoxify all of it. And I think the reason why is very simple. As I've said before, I mean, we live in an increasingly toxic environment. 
um, chances are good that many of the people listening right now, and maybe you too, are, are connected to Wi-Fi. Mm. And you are right now making it more difficult for your body to function properly. Um, I, I've got a, a network cable here, which runs across the floor, because when I built this apartment, I put the jack over there and then realized, oh, I want my desk over here. Mm. So, um, you know, the thing runs across, usually under the rug here. Uh, I've got another network jack in my bedroom and another one here on the patio outside so I can sit with the computer anywhere I want, but I've got to plug in. Right. And, you know, the problem is, is that the average person is eating multiple times per day is eating things that are toxic to the body. If you're not eating organic food, you're consuming pesticides every time you eat. If you're eating processed food, there's over a 95% chance that what you're eating contains genetically modified ingredients, which have been shown to be quite harmful to the body. You know, again, cell phone towers everywhere, uh, all the toxins. And so the body is simply unable to keep up with the job of detoxifying as quickly as those toxins are coming in. And this means vitality and health decrease over time. Uh, if we don't get this stuff out of the body, it has a significant impact. And I believe directly creates diseases. In fact, you know, natural hygiene has been saying for 150 years, this is a philosophy of health that says uh, we live according to the laws of nature if we want to be as healthy as possible. And it informs a lot of what I do and believe. But uh, natural hygiene, you know, has always said that there's only one disease and that's toxemia. Right. It's a toxic body. Get, you know, get the toxins out of the body and there's no disease. And you know, I, and I'm just going to add one, one quick piece, if I may. Um, you know, I personally, um, you had said something about, you know, you, like you are a better therapist because you've been through psychotherapy. Right. Right. Um, I agree. I mean, how can you offer something if you haven't been through? I don't know if people are aware of this, but at least in the U.S., you can be a psychologist without ever going through therapy. Wow. That's sad. You can't be a psychiatrist, but you can be a psychologist. I, I think I think that should be illegal. I think if you're going to be a psychologist, you have to go through therapy for at least a year or two first to deal with your own stuff and actually know what it feels like to go through the process. You know, you get better at it that way. Um, I've fasted myself dozens of times, roughly three years of my life cumulatively. Wow. Now. Um, there, you know, the guy that the, my my. Uh, colleague who runs my biggest competitor has done one 21 day fast and a bunch of one week fasts and that's it right right yeah and uh, definitely for myself like people were quite enthusiastic to hear about how it went and they noticed my skin looking brighter and all sorts of things but I was remiss to say too much before i had a little bit of experience under my belt and let um surely some more to come in the future so yeah. Um, I guess I was thinking, yeah, so when you're talking about long-term fast, this sounds so scary to people. Let's go through what one can expect to happen sort of first, because there's a couple of watershed moments in the fasting process. But like, as one thing is, we know, uh, I, I'm influenced by the, the yogic system as well, where they, they also want you to have your meals, like you say in your videos, within a six or eight hour period, because then your digestive system's off for a long, as long as possible. So since watching your videos, if I'm hungry in the evening, I think, do you know what? I'll just leave it till tomorrow. I want my digestive system to be off. Um, yeah. The longer, your tutelage is that the longer you allow your digestive system to be off, the deeper the process goes. So you'd be much better doing a 21 day fast, say, than a three, seven day fasts, or a nine day fast than three, three day fasts. Well, let, let, let me, let me uh, approach that from a different direction. Where exactly is home for you? Uh, I live in Scotland, in Glasgow, yeah. And you're in Glasgow, okay. Yeah. So let's say you wanna walk from Glasgow to Edinburgh. How right. far is that? Right. That's 60 yeah. kilometers? Yeah, it's, uh, it's only it's only fifty minutes on the train, but it's quite a lengthy walk. Maybe you take a, it, over a day. 50, 60 kilometers, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let, let's say that tomorrow morning you decide I'm going to walk to Edinburgh, and you start out walking, and you get about ten kilometers, and you think, "Oh, my feet hurt. I shouldn't have worn these shoes. I'll catch a ride home, and I'll start out again tomorrow." Right. <clears throat> and so you you you've walked ten kilometers. You go home. 
The next morning you set out again, you make it around 10 kilometers again, and you think, you know what? Yeah, I should have gotten left a little earlier. It's getting kind of late. Uh, sun's coming up. It's getting hot out here. I think I'll head on back, and I'll, but I'll, I'll do this again tomorrow. And the next day, you know, something else happens. You do this six days in a row, okay? You've walked 60 kilometers. How, how far away from Edinburgh are you? Um, I'm not in Edinburgh. I'm, no, I'm you, never going to get there. You've, you've, you've only gone 10 kilometers. You're never going to get there. And the problem is, is that when we fast, there's a series of stages and right. it takes 10 to 11 days to get to the deepest part of the process. Right. You can do all the seven day fasts that you like. You could fast for seven days a million times. You're never going to accomplish what happens when you have 10 or 11 days in the deepest part of the process, which okay. is why we do 21 days minimum most of the time. Right, right. Right. So, so, so let's parse that out from people. What happens in the first day? What happens on the second day, third, okay. fourth day? When, sure. Well, so, so after your meal, uh, your body is looking for nutrients or calories. It's going to go to the digestive after your last meal to the digestive tract. And it's going to, it's going to be able to get what it needs from your digestive tract for about eight to 12 hours. After that, whatever is still there is no longer really useful to it. And so at that point, what your body is going to be primarily looking for is glucose as we are glucose burning organisms. Glucose is our primary source of fuel. And so the body is always looking for glucose. Well, if we have nothing in the digestive tract that we can use and you know, we're not eating, what the body's going to do is it's going to go to the liver where we store glycogen. Glycogen is a glucose precursor. So the body takes glycogen and readily converts it to glucose. And we, now we have some glucose. We have a supply of glucose, uh, typically about an eight to 12 hour supply. So on average, when we're around 20 hours into the process, we've depleted the liver's glycogen reserves. Now we also store glycogen in the muscles, but we don't use muscle glycogen when we're fasting. And I'll, I'll give you a very quick uh, illustration of why that is. Female polar bears, they don't fast excuse me, they don't hibernate, but they do something that looks like hibernation when they're pregnant. What they do is they, they build themselves a den under the ground, under the snow. They go in there for five months. They give birth. They nurse their cubs without eating or drinking anything for five months. Okay, five months fasting, all right, nearly half the year. When they come out, they're half the weight that they went at it because they're, they're running on their bodies, fat reserves, and you know, we haven't really got to this, but this is how fasting is possible. And this is why we store fat on the body. Right. Okay. The reason that the body stores fat, I mean, we, you know, people are fat because they eat poorly. They eat too many calories and they eat a bunch of crap. But the reason the body, you know, why doesn't the body have some mechanism to just pass what it doesn't want and get rid of it? We store it because in nature, there are floods and fires and droughts. There are conditions where food may not be available. You know, in, in certain parts of Africa, there's, they, they have to go months without rain. That means no food for many animals because there's nothing growing. Everything dries up, becomes a desert, like the Kalahari Desert dries up. When it rains, all of a sudden, there's all this life. And, but animals sometimes have to go a long time between meals. We store fat specifically so that we can survive in the absence of food. And people think you're starving. No, you're not. You're running on that, that reserve of calories that you stored mm. specifically for this purpose. Unfortunately, we have to get to that stage. It doesn't happen immediately. And I'll explain why that is. But the body stores, so the polar bear emerges from her den with her two cubs. They typically birth two at a time. And in order to get their first meal on average, they've got to walk 75 miles. Now, she's eaten nothing for five months. Her cubs have been feeding on the milk she's been producing for them. They should be okay although that might be a long way for a little cub. But in order for her to walk 75 miles, she's eaten nothing for five months. Might it be a good idea if her muscles still had some fuel? Right. That's why the body doesn't use muscle glycogen. It saves that muscle glycogen because when, when the time comes that we're ready to eat again, you know, if you and I, if we're living in the tropical jungle that our ancestors emerged from, we may have to climb it up into a tree to find food. How are we going to do that if we're, if we're weak and okay. don't have any strength? Now, interestingly, people do become very weak when they fast. And they imagine 
that it's because they don't have food, but it's not. It's right. not. And I can tell you that because I've done as much fasting as I have. Right. These days, I fast when I have something specific I need to heal from, an injury, basically. And so two years ago, uh, in August, early August, um, I'd come, we were closed at the time. My staff was gone for the day. I got home around 6.30. It was dark. I went to open the front door of this building. I'm in the main building here at the center. And my key broke off in the lock. And I thought, that's the only key I have. Right. So I figured, okay, well, I'll go around to the back of my apartment. I've got a, a patio here with a high wall around it. And I'll go to the back of the apartment. I didn't have a key for the door here. But I figured I can climb up over the wall and jump down into the uh, garden here. And I can, I can break in my back door. Not that hard to do. Um, probably shouldn't be saying that on the air, but that's not that hard to get in here. So uh, now this time of year, this is the rainy season here. And as always, you know, and right now I've got flip-flops on. I, I come back in my shorts and flip-flops. It's raining. I get up on top of this concrete wall. And I, as, I, as I turn around to come down backwards, I'm going to grab the wall, I, you know, use my feet on the wall. I slip. Oh, and I fall from, from where my hip was to the concrete below is about three meters. Right. And I broke my right hip. Oh, Lord, so, you're some man. You're some so, man. <laughs> so I fasted and only fasted to allow it to heal. Okay, that's, that's all I did. But unlike my clients, I, I was in severe pain at that point. But, you know, I've, I've, broken, uh, I've broken two toes in it when I rolled my quadricycle a couple of years ago. Uh, I broke a finger surfing uh, a couple of years ago. You know, there's an example. I was fine except the finger. I had tons of energy. I felt completely clear. I felt perfectly fine while fasting. In fact, I was fasting for the first 10 days of a fasting session, and my clients didn't know it. I didn't right. tell them because, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't want them to worry or anything. I felt they couldn't tell because I felt perfectly fine. I can tell when they're fasting because right. they're laying around going, uh, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the reason people feel that way isn't because there's a lack of food. Your body's being fed. The reason people feel weak and tired is because there's toxins in the bloodstream. Right. The body's detoxifying. In the absence of those, when the body is clean, fasting is easy. Right. In fact, you started out by saying how people don't think they can skip a meal. Yeah. Now, I have a joke about this whenever I'm speaking. I'll say, you know, most people think if they skip lunch, they'll probably die. Right. That's very right. And what I... What I've always told people is the harder it is to skip a meal, the more, the more you, meals you probably need to skip. Right. And I, I'm sure that's true. Even in my longest fast, uh, not that long by, by the standards of people that go visit you in Costa Rica. And um, I have to say, I didn't feel hungry. I just felt bored of not eating in the last couple of days. Well, uh, I was easily out of breath. and Boredom, I, boredom is common. Yeah. Uh, now, out of breath is interesting. Um, you're out of breath. I believe the primary reason that people become out of breath is because all the garbage in the bloodstream prevents you from carrying as much oxygen right. as you normally would be able to. Okay. And so even though you fill your lungs, you're having trouble getting enough air to your cells. But boredom, I believe, happens because, and this, this again, this is our next conversation perhaps, but boredom happens because your ego is... Boredom is your ego screaming at you to do something so you don't have to feel the suppressed emotions which start right. to bubble up to the surface. And, and specifically, I was bored of not eating. Like, I just wanted to have a meal for the sake of, you know, experiencing flavor and eating. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. like, you know, uh, I, 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 I wasn't hungry. I didn't feel like I needed... No, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, there's no, there won't be hunger for most people for six to eight weeks. Right. Because that's how long the average person's reserves will last. Now, you look like you're a pretty lean guy. Yeah, yeah. I was, I'm going to ask you about that as well. It, does, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I've got a woman who will be back here on Monday. She's the woman who actually, for the last eight months or so, has been editing my videos. She's a volunteer, a young Russian woman in her early 30s. When she first came to me three years ago at 5'7 plus, she was 88 pounds. Right. Okay. Um, that's uh, for the, the metric listeners, that's 172 
and 40 kilos yeah. when she started her process, when she started. For very, very, very lean. She had unmedicated type 1 diabetes. Her blood sugar was super high. It's like being on speed all the time. She couldn't gain weight. She fasted 21 days. She lost 40% as much weight as the average person does. That's what happens. Someone who's very lean loses less weight. Someone who's very heavy loses more weight. But everyone within a normal range loses the same amount of weight. It's amazing right. what happens. Right. If it's done properly, my clients will lose 21 pounds uh, virtually every, every time with 21 days. 11 pounds the first week, seven the second, and three the third. Wow. So, yeah. But, but we know what's going on. Um, coming back to your, your earlier question, we're, you know, we're going through glycogen. And by the time we get to about 20 hours, we're done with, gly with liver glycogen. So what does the body do then? Well, probably not what you want it to do, right? right? Because we're set up to run on sugar, the body's looking for a source of sugar. That's its primary preferred fuel. So what does it do? It converts small amounts of muscle to sugar. And there are people who tell me every day how stupid I am. This is crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Why would it do? There's also an MD in Canada who says that's not what happens. But he's never measured it. We actually measure body fat and muscle mass every week, and we see muscle mass declining, going I, down. This I don't know that why that's controversial. I mean, some of people's, many people's first objection to fasting to me was, oh, yeah, you know, I've been going to the gym and I don't want to lose muscle. You know, yeah. they don't want to lose muscle. And they, they well, admit that it's out of vanity that they won't fast. Right. And, and I mean, and, and some people are concerned because normally, if you simply don't work the muscles for a few weeks, you begin to lose yeah. some, some muscle. But, but here we're talking about I know the body I actually, but body's actually converting small amounts of muscle to sugar because there's not, there, there's not really sugar available from fat and your brain and a couple other organs need to have some glucose. So we can run, the body can run on ketones. That's what being in ketosis is, a ketogenic diet. It's a diet that puts you in ketosis by uh, dramatically limiting or eliminating carbohydrates. So there's no sugar available. The body runs on fat. If the body runs on fat, you eliminate fat. And you feel, you might feel good, but you're doing something that's very toxic to the body that our bodies were never set up for. We don't have the digestive physiology of animals that eat other animals. And so you can, you can do this, but the science is actually really clear. I mean, there, yes, there's controversy because there's so many people that like the way they feel, mm. but the science is clear long-term. This is horrible for your liver, for your kidneys, for your digestive tract. You create all kinds of problems. You know, again, our, our 32 foot long digestive tracts from one end to the other require fiber and water to move things through. Animal products contain no fiber. And so it's right. hard to move this stuff through the system. And what winds up happening is you wind up creating a situation where there's toxic material stuck in the digestive tract. Anyway, um, so we, we switch over to muscle at about 20 hours, tiny amounts. You're, it's, it's not like you're going to see your biceps decrease while you're fasting. Um, you know, it's tiny amounts of muscle. It's, and it's not really noticeable. In fact, even after 21 day fasts, we've had some people who felt stronger than they felt before. Right. I mean, right at the end of their fast, most people are going to feel a bit weak because of the toxins. By the time people have done a week of guided refeeding with me, assuming they do it correctly with me, most people feel amazing, much stronger than before. And that's because you're now far more efficient body is going to rebuild muscle faster than it ever has. And your more efficient body is better able to access strength that you weren't accessing before. So we're never accessing 100% of the strength of the body. You've, you've probably heard about the, you know, the, the fables. I don't know if they're actually true. The, you know, the 120-pound housewife whose kid is stuck under the car. So she picks the car up with one hand and pulls the kid out with the other. Right. I don't know if that actually happens. Mm. But when it's true that when we're on adrenaline, mm. we have more strength than usual. And that's because we were never accessing all of our strength. Adrenaline allows us to access more of it. OK, so when we're our bodies are more efficient, we're accessing more of that strength. So how long does the body burn muscle? It depends on how much you have. Um, if someone is super, super skinny, doesn't have a lot of muscle mass, the body won't won't continue to consume muscle 
as long as it would if the body had tons of muscle. Let's say someone's uh, you know, six feet tall and they're, they're 125 pounds, they're not gonna stay very long consuming muscle. Let's say that they're six feet tall and 250 pounds of solid muscle, a bodybuilder. Um, they're gonna consume muscle a little bit longer because the body can afford to. Mm -hmm. Be because again, we're set up to run on sugar and your body doesn't know that you've decided, let's say my client's bodies, body doesn't know they've decided to go 21 or 26 or 30 days. They just know, well, it's been four days, you know, three days, and there's still no food coming in, no fuel coming in. Let's just take a tiny amount of muscle. It, it's, you know, the incremental amount that's consuming each time is tiny. What happens is it gets to a certain point where it says, I don't want to lose any more muscle. Now let's switch over to a safe long-term source of fuel, but it requires switching fuels. It's, you know, it's a process. That's fat. And that's where we begin to consume fat as a primary source of fuel. And you say that this happens usually around day three or day four, people switch from muscles to fat. Yeah, start, starting around day, day about halfway through, uh, well, day three, three and a half for most people, we begin to switch over to, to fat. And it takes about 10 or 11 days to be fully in the fat consuming right. process. We're still, we're always going to lose a little bit of muscle throughout the process because your brain needs sugar and we're right. not getting it from fat. So, so, and what's the body been cleansing during these first couple of days and then up to the 11th day? Well, we start out by beginning to filter out of the bloodstream anything that doesn't belong there. The body immediately begins to break plaque down in the bloodstream. Now, you know, I, I can imagine a 25 or, or even 35 year old listener going, I don't have any plaque in my arteries. I'm fine. I'm healthy. Studies in North America over the last 25 years, or the most recent one that I saw was about five years ago. They studied nine year olds in North America and found the average nine year old's arteries were 30% blocked with plaque. Shocking. Sure, in an older study from 20 or so, about 20 years ago, maybe 15, 18 years ago, it said the average 14 year old's arteries were 40% blocked with plaque at the age of 14. And, and unfortunately, what this means. You know, if you carry it forward, if you assume that they continue, that the, the, the nine-year-old in a recent study continues to create that plaque at the same rate that they've been doing it, those kids who are now more than 14, because this was more than five years ago, those kids are unfortunately worse off than the 14-year-olds were 20 years ago. It's right. getting worse. It's not getting better. Right. You know, again, the average person's eating more and more of their calories from processed foods. So if I can offer one very quick takeaway, you know, whether you agree, decide to follow the diet that I recommend or not, which I guarantee you, by the way, if you're listening, would be the, one of the best things you could do for yourself would be to stop eating cooked food and stop eating animal products and stop eating anything processed. Eat only whole, I mean, basically what I eat is fruit, mono fruit meals, and simple green salads most of the time. The only exceptions are if I'm in a raw vegan restaurant or something, I might have a little bit more of a gourmet meal. But if you do that, amazing, amazing shifts begin to happen. It's incredible what happens when you, when you make that change. Right. And then I, I note that we've probably only got five minutes left. Uh, wet, we've wet people's appetite. I, there's so much more I'd love to cover with you. Maybe yeah. if we're very lucky, we can revisit. Uh, we can talk about diet next time. Um, sure. So the, so after you say something magical starts happening after 10 or 11 days. Now that's as far as I've gone. I stopped on day 11.5 because I didn't think it was prudent for me to doing this on my own. And um, what, what magic lies in store for me if I one, one day decide to go beyond the 11. Well, what, what happens is it's not that there's a significant shift in what's happening. It's a simply a question of, the efficiency and effectiveness. So it becomes right. much deeper beyond day 10 or 11. And most people actually feel right around that point, feel things go deeper. Um, but what, what's happening, let, let's, let's go all the way back to the very beginning. Um, you know, what are the benefits? Well, so your body is detoxifying. And this is, this is very real. It's been shown to be, you know, to be true. This is what's going on. In fact, uh, there's a term that's become commonly known over just the last few years autophagy. Autophagy means, comes from the Greek, it means self-auto uh, eat, self-eat. Autophagy is the body's consuming 
the garbage it doesn't want, damaged cells, uh, anything else. It's going to consume anything that it doesn't want, take anything useful, and eliminate the rest. And the 2016 Nobel Prize for Medicine went to a Japanese PhD named Yoshinori Osumi. And Osumi's 25 years, for his 25 years of work, demonstrating that autophagy exists and that it's much more efficient and effective in the absence of food. Right. This happens most efficiently while fasting. In fact, um, you may have been heard some of the news from probably six or seven years ago. They, they discovered um, that we have these little tails on our DNA. And these, these tails demonstrate how much life we have left, how long we have to live. Um, when we're born, they're very long, typically. Right. And they get shorter and shorter as we age. And if we overexercise, they get shorter. If we consume drugs or alcohol or, you know, crap food, they get shorter. All these things are affecting them over time. The one thing that's been shown to re-lengthen them is fasting. Wow. And that's because fat, literally by the time you're 20 hours into the fast, you've got 3,000% the normal amount of human growth hormone. That means 30 times as much as usual. Wow. Human growth hormone is called the youthing hormone. So people literally become physiologically younger. And if I have someone here, for instance, I recently fasted a gentleman who was 72, if I remember correctly. He had severe hypertension, 165 over whatever it was. And, and what that means is he had about a 90% greater chance of heart attack or stroke than the average person his age. Those are not very good odds, given that heart attacks are the number one cause of death for people his age, and they're happening pretty commonly. I mean, he'd already lost many of his, his, you know, his, his uh, friends. Um, so he went from being severely hypertensive to having below normal blood pressure, which, by the way, has happened every time except one time where it was just above, it was like 125, you know, 120 over 80 is normal. I had a client who was 125 or something over, you know, whatever it was, um, where usually they're actually below 120 with 21 days of fasting or more. And that's, that's happened with more than 600 clients in the last 22 and a half years. We've been operating now 22 and a half years. So I fasted thousands of people for an average of 26 days. We see amazing things, type two diabetes. Uh, you know, this is another condition like hypertension which medicine says you can't cure. Right. We've got 100% success eliminating oh. it with roughly 100 clients. We just saw it happen again. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a client finish. He started with diabetes. He's now living on fruit, has no blood sugar issues whatsoever. Okay, we see this over and over. I have a young girl, uh, 23 years old, from Saudi Arabia, who uh, she was, had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Fortunately, it was relatively early, so she didn't have a lot of symptoms, but she had some symptoms. There were some issues. Her husband was very supportive of her doing, you know, she's very intelligent, and she did the research, and he said, honey, you know, if this is what you want to do, I'll support you. He didn't really understand it. There were times during the process where he was kind of freaking out because she was having a hard time. That can happen. Yeah. It's, it's a, it can be a challenging process physically and emotionally. At the end of the process, he got on the phone with me and said, he said, I, I can't thank you enough. I have a new wife. She's 100% mm -hmm. she's better with no evidence, no symptoms whatsoever of multiple sclerosis. And we see this all the time. We say I, the same thing with Lyme disease, not in every case, but it, the very lower GI tract problems that medicine says you can medicate, but you can never eliminate. We see them healing all the time. Our bodies are self-healing and fasting long enough and properly is the single most beneficial thing that most people can do for themselves. And I just meant to mention that even for people who don't have serious conditions that might think, well, I don't need one of these long-term fasts, maybe I'll just take it easy. One of the things that you've mentioned is that people have hard, sticky stuff in their digestive system that takes days and days to rehydrate. And that you see people evacuating at the bottom, even during the third week of the fast and things like that, stuff that you reckon they would never evacuate if they weren't fasting. 
Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, two quick points before I have to go. I right. got another call in just a minute. Um, yeah, uh, in fact, now most of the really old material, the hard stuff that's been there for decades, doesn't actually get eliminated until someone's fasted 21 days and until they're eating again because it requires okay. three to five days worth of food coming in to help move it out. Right. The stuff is yeah. hard and dry. Um, we see this every single time. Now, my competitor, their average fast is 10 days or less. They, they have people limit the amount of water they consume. Um, I have people limited too, but my clients are drinking on average two and a half to three times as much water as theirs are. And by doing it correctly, we don't run into problems 99.99% of the time. Um, and we have to give the body enough time to break this stuff down and enough water to rehydrate it. And so we see people maybe six to eight times a year who went there, didn't get the results they wanted, and then came here and they did. And in fact, it's interesting because I, I published about five, five months ago, I think, a video on my YouTube channel about mucoid plaque, this old hard material in the, in the digestive tract. And someone forwarded me a video that had recently been published by the MD who was supervising fast at this other place. And he said, the stuff doesn't exist. He was there eight years, he's not there anymore, but he was there eight years supervising fasts and he thinks it doesn't exist. Well, that can only be explained by one very simple idea. He never saw any. Right. And he, never, he never saw any because his people didn't rest enough, they didn't fast long enough, and they didn't get enough water in order to get that stuff out. And getting that stuff out changes everything. I believe it's the primary cause, one of the primary causes of many conditions, because that stuff is sitting there. It's toxic. It's going to have an effect on us always until we get rid of it. Um, the other th piece I wanted to mention, you know, people say, come on, you know, doctors have looked at colons. There's nothing in there colonoscopies look at the colon only. The colon is 20% of the digestive tract, okay, a little tiny bit less. And most of it's in the small intestine. In, in roughly uh, a foot, 30 centimeters on my fairly little tall body, I'm six feet tall, 182, there's 20, roughly 20 feet of small intestine in that, in that space. You know, So it's all twists and turns where the, the large intestine, the colon is relatively straight. There's yes. only a couple of bends and there's a gentle curve. Um, not the small intestine. It's all twists and turns. So I recently fasted a young man for the third time. He'd had his colon removed between his second and third fast. He had colon cancer. His colon was completely black, dead tissue. They removed the entire thing. He now has an ileostomy. The ileum, small intestine, comes through the abdomen and goes into a bag like a fanny pack he wears around his belly, which he has to dump out every day when he's eating. While fasting with me for 42 days, there was old hard material entering that bag from his small intestine every single day wow. for six weeks. Okay. Well, Lauren, on that, I know you've got to go for your next call. I can't thank you enough for joining me and Be Yourself and Love It podcast. I would love to do a part two with you because sure. there's so sure. much that we could cover. I'd be happy to. I hope that we've wet people's appetite for that. Uh, you at home, be yourself. Well, don't just be yourself. Be yourself and love it. Right. Even better. Yeah. Perfect. Um, 